Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to this Tuesday, March 13th, Market Watchers Live show with your hosts, Tom Boley and Aaron Swinlin. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show. And for our regulars, welcome back. Well, the market got off to a good start this morning. We saw some uh, positive numbers, but things have turned a bit. You can see the Dow Jones is still clinging to a 12-point game. The uh, S&P 500 down nearly two points. The NASDAQ, which was up pretty significantly earlier today, now down 28 points, potentially putting in a bearish engulfing candle. We'll talk about that later. The Russell 2000 also getting close to an all-time high today near 1610. Uh, but it has turned back around at 1598, down three points today. Ten-year Treasury yield was down earlier today, but it has reversed down just one basis point now to 2.86%. The volatility index continues to hover around that 16 level. It's closed below it the last two days. Bulls trying to get control of the action here. Transport's having a nice day, trying to make the breakout above that February, late February reaction high. Uh, among the uh, transports, you can see airlines having a nice day, but we do have overhead gap resistance that we are contending with. Uh, railroads also at a key level near 1900. You can see over the past uh, month, month and a half, we've had a couple of tests up near 1900. We have failed. It'll be interesting to see whether or not we can finish uh, and close above that 1900 level. Internet stocks really struggling, and that's part of the reason why we're seeing this big uh, reversal in the NASDAQ today. Uh, the Internet stocks... Even though we've seen other areas of technology making breakouts to all-time highs, we have not yet seen it on the Internet. We got close, and now we're getting a big reversal here, down 20 points, more than 1% in that group. Twitter, one of the strongest stocks in the space. We've talked about it recently, being the, or at least having uh, the highest scooter rank among uh, the large caps. And Twitter uh, is struggling today. You can see down at more than 3%, and that is weighing on the Internet space. And then finally, Qualcomm. This is an interesting uh, play today because President Trump came out, issued an order to block Broadcom's takeover attempt, citing risks to national security. And as a result, Qualcomm down 4.5%, falling below key support recently. And with that, I will bring in my co-host, Aaron. How are you doing, Aaron? I'm doing very well today. That is good. We also have with us the president of Stock Charts, Chip Anderson. How are you doing, Chip? Hey, Tom. Hey, Aaron. We're doing great. Yeah, we, we brought you in, Chip, under the disguise of everything stock charts, but really what I want is everything basketball. Uh, I know that you are an alumni of the defending national champ Tar Heels, and I just need to know before you go today how I need to proceed on my bracket. Can they win it two years in a row? Well, we're going to try. That's for sure. Uh, Virginia looks pretty strong. They beat us the other day. Uh, I think they – I was asking my friends, you know, do the emperor – uh, have any clothes on or was Virginia for real? And uh, they looked for real the other day. Uh, we'll have to see though anything can happen in the uh, in March Madness. Yeah, I think they're for real. I've, I've watched them play. I have no idea. Of course, you know, my daughter went to Virginia Tech, so I'm a, a converted Virginia Tech Hokie fan. And I have no idea how we pulled off the win in Charlottesville to beat Virginia earlier this year. But uh, we'll see. The, the tournament's a new ball game. It's win or go home. So uh, very interesting indeed. That'll start later this week. But we got the market. I know uh, Chip's going to be coming back with us here in about 10 or 15 minutes. He'll give you the latest on stock charts. Aaron, how are things out in on the uh, West Coast? I know. I don't talk basketball. It's just not my thing. And uh, I don't really want to talk about hockey right now. The Ducks lost three in a row. It's uh, We're still in third place, but oh, dear. So I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, trying to hang on. Well, hockey, you know, the thing is with hockey and the NBA, they, these sports seem to go on forever. I mean, I, it's hard for me to really get into it until we get into the playoffs. And then, of course, track record of my caps, uh, not very good in the playoffs. But anyway. Yes. Well, maybe you'll, you should make it, though. I'm getting worried about the Ducks here. It'll save me money, of course, if they don't make the playoffs. But I, <laughs> I'd be really bummed out. Yeah, We've got a great week this week. Mm-hmm. Greg Morris is going to be here tomorrow, uh, the author of Dancing with the Trend and a regular blogger here at Stock Charts. Julius DeKempener is going to be joining us, the creator of RRG Charts, on Thursday. And then Friday, I'm going to be doing a workshop. I have not picked my topic yet, but some of the ideas uh, that are floating around are moving averages in general, long-term investing with stops, uh, volume indicators. So some of the ideas if you want to add some to the list just when you take the survey at the end of the show go ahead and give me some ideas i'll take them in the chat room too 
So today's agenda, we're going to start off again with uh, everything stock charts with Chip Anderson right after our technical news. Cause and effect, we're bringing back this segment and we'll explain it when we get there. 10 and 10 to 1, our first symbol is going to be, I think, yes, Gardner Denver Holdings, GDI. So if you want to go take a peek at that chart. And finally, we're going to finish with a what would you do? All right. Sounds good. Let's jump into the technical news and headlines today and take a look at some of the things we need to kind of keep an eye on. You can see the 10-year Treasury yield fairly flat. We were down earlier today. Uh, we did get a couple of economic, well, actually one economic report out. February CPI. Of course, uh, this is the consumer price index, so we're looking at inflation on the consumer level. And the market, in my opinion, was really, um, I don't know, maybe a little bit uh, fearful of higher inflation. I think that was the scare in February, more so than higher interest rates. And so on Friday, we got the jobs report out. The wage inflation data there was uh, pretty tame. And same thing today for the February CPI. came in at plus 0.2% exactly what the market was looking for. Core CPI also plus 0.2%, exactly what the market was looking for. So no big surprises with inflation on Friday, none today. And I think that is helping the market calm down. We've seen with the VIX, uh, recently anyway, the VIX has been settling down after getting up over 50 back in February. It has been hovering around this 15 to 16 range. So this is something to kind of keep an eye on. Let me pull up that VIX so that you can see where we currently are sitting. And uh, we have been in this downtrend for a while. We are uh, moving back up today, back up a little bit above 16. We're up 3.6%, but the overall trend has been mostly lower since we had that huge uh, spike in fear back in the beginning of February. So this is something I'm gonna continue to watch. I wanna see where we finish. If we do you know, uh, rally back on the VIX, continue to finish higher, then I think that brings into play uh, potentially some more downside. However, we have seen strengthening in some areas. First, I'm going to mention is the NASDAQ. And I'm going to pull this chart up because I think things have changed. Even though we're starting to see a little pickup in volatility, we also have seen a breakout on the NASDAQ to new highs. And you can see the PPO strengthening. I think this is a very good sign. Uh, that particular candle doesn't look good. And I'm going to point you to the hourly charts because there were some warnings uh, here with the highs earlier today, you can see that the NASDAQ in printing a new high on the 60 minute chart, uh, we did have higher PPOs, but they have rolled over and we actually have a negative divergence on the move earlier today to the upside. I think this could carry us to a 50 hour test, which is all the way down at gap support around 74 and a quarter. So I would not be shocked to see uh, weakness extend here in the near term. The NASDAQ potentially could go down another one, one and a half percent to uh, reset it's uh, hourly PPO, maybe back down to the center line area. But it's not just the NASDAQ. When I start seeing multiple indexes and key areas print negative divergences, it does uh, start to bother me a little bit more here. You can see higher prices on the Russell 2000. The, the hourly PPO has rolled over. We have a negative divergence here as well. And what that tells me, whenever I've got the PPO rising, it's telling me that momentum is building to the upside. Usually these 20 period tests hold as support. Once they start to roll over, once the PPO rolls over, then I think uh, or I start to look beyond that 20 day or 20 period, in this case, 20 hour, uh, and look more toward the rising 50 period moving average, which is now at 1570 and continuing to move. We also have some price support on the rut uh, at about 1575 to 1580. So another, again, maybe 1%, one and a half percent on the Russell 2000, not out of the question to the downside as we move forward. Uh, but that, again, is not where it ends. We've got uh, the XLK, uh, which is the technology ETF. Check out higher prices and that PPO rolling over. And so far, we're struggling at that 20-period moving average to hold. Again, we've got uh, between support and uh, our price support, gap support, I'm going to say 69 and a quarter to about 69.75. We're currently at 70.13, so perhaps another 1% or so on the XLK to reset this hourly PPO back near that center line. Uh, again, something to consider. Uh, now, as far as the overall market goes, I feel pretty good about things and I'll show you why. First, we're gonna take the, uh, actually, I'm gonna go to a daily chart. Let's take the XLK relative to the S&P 500. 
and I like using a line chart as opposed to candlesticks. Um, but what this tells you is that on a relative basis, when we've, as we've been breaking out, the XLK is leading the S&P 500 in its move to new relative highs. Normally what you see with bear markets is money rotating away from aggressive areas of the market and more into defense as we break out. In this case, we're seeing the opposite. We're seeing money continually rotate towards aggressive areas of the market. Traders continue to have that risk on appetite and that is what fuels bull markets. So I'm, you know, outside of maybe the, the volatility index still being a little bit elevated and maybe having some inflationary fears that we certainly need to keep an eye on, uh, I really don't see a whole lot underneath the surface of this market that uh, makes me uh, particularly nervous as we move forward. Um, if we look at the financials relative to the S&P 500, uh, we moved up. And even though we had all of that selling and, and the fear and the weakness in February, on a relative basis, I think financials have held up pretty well here relative to the S&P 500. So no big issues there. The XLI industrials, we have started to see some weakness here. Part of it is because Boeing has been pulling back. Boeing, uh, one of the, well, Boeing is the largest component of the XLI. And so that is certainly having a little bit of an impact. But we also have to consider the huge move, the huge relative move that this area made uh, prior to this weakness that we've seen in 2018. So I'm gonna give the XLI the benefit of the doubt, although I do wanna see this begin to turn back up again. Um, and then finally, we look at the last area of aggressive, or last aggressive area, the XLY, and we compare that to the S&P 500, and it continues to perform well. I mean, we're slightly moving down here over the past six weeks or so, but again, this uh, follows a very, very strong relative period for consumer discretionary stocks. So I think we're looking pretty good. Uh, mentioned the industrials a minute ago. One key area to watch are transports. Transports put in this tail. I don't like this tail today above the breakout level at 10,800. And when I refer to the tail, it's an intraday move. You can see that uh, we met, made it above 10,800 up to 10,824. That cleared the prior reaction high. So, you know, if you're a uh, trading the market and you see a breakout, you want to buy. The, the problem is, is when you get the reversal, a lot of times you've got market makers on the other side of the trades. And when you get these false breakouts, it can lead to some short-term weakness. And that kind of follows suit with those negative divergences I was showing you recently. So let's watch this 10,800 level, see if we can clear it on the close. If not, I think it's possible we make another push back down here to test the rising 20 uh, day moving average here on the transports. Within the transports, I mentioned earlier, airlines. Here are the airlines and check out where we got to and look at the gap resistance. So basically we went up all the way. It took us uh, five or six weeks off the bottom, but we made it all the way back up to test the bottom of gap resistance. And we have pulled back now about three, three and a quarter points off of that earlier high. Not looking so great at this point. Let's see how it finishes. The uh, railroads, another part of the transports, I think we have to be very careful. 1900 has been a very critical area over the past six, seven weeks. And we got right up there. Looked like maybe we were gonna make that breakout and we have reversed. So we're seeing a lot of this across the market. So I, I like the fact that the overall big picture has turned more bullish, but here in the near term, I don't like what I'm seeing uh, so far this morning after having really nice push to the upside and then reversing back. Um, retail stocks, I looked at the top stocks in the S&P 500. Many of the retailers are littered among the top 10 to 15 S&P 500 stocks. And I'm just gonna pull up a couple of them here. First is Macy's. This was the best performer in the S&P earlier. When I checked on this, it's up 4% today. Very strong pattern, by the way. Uh, gapped up with earnings, took out prior resistance after sideways consolidating. I think the action here is very bullish, although we are still consolidating after that gap up. Uh, so we do need to kind of keep an eye on that. Uh, Kohl's, KSS, this is one I mentioned recently. I think it's in an ascending triangle, equal highs, rising lows, starting to make a move, needs more volume. But I could see here clearly down the road a breakout above that 68 and a half resistance area on KSS. Let's take a look at Gap GPS. 
Another one that uh, is doing extremely uh, well today, up uh, about 1.6%, much better than the overall market. I think it's got gap support down here at about 31.75. That's what I'm watching. We could head back down to that level. But ultimately, I think this sideways consolidation off this uptrend will eventually break and we will move to the upside. Last stock before I bring uh, Chip in, let's take a look at Qualcomm. This is the one I mentioned at the top of the show. President Trump ordered uh, this uh, ordered Qual Qualcomm, um, their um, buyout of Broadcom, President Trump blocked it. He ordered it to block this transaction, citing risk to national security. And here you can see Qualcomm taking out a pretty important support level at about 61. We gapped down into the 50s, came back up, tested 61, and have pulled back down. You can see already volume very strong today. I'd be really careful with Qualcomm at this point. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Chip Anderson. How are you doing, Chip? Hey, Tom. Doing great. Um, thanks for that update. Very interesting. I'm going to take a second to share my screen. And I'm going to click on a couple of things here. And then welcome everyone to Everything Stock Charts. Does that look good? Looks great. All right. Um, so I've got a couple of things to uh, share with everybody about what we've been up to. And then I want to talk a little bit about point and figure charts, one of my favorite kinds of charting. Remind everybody about that. So a couple of things that are new at stock charts. Um, if you uh, heard me talk in uh, previous months about what we've been doing and why I haven't been on the air that frequently, it's mainly because we've been focusing on moving to the cloud from a technology standpoint. This is going to make our site more available, more reliable, faster. We're going to be able to grow it and add more features to it once all that once this entire move is is done. We've made some significant progress actually over the past um, two or three weeks uh, with now having a demo site. None of this is on the live site, but we have a demo site now that's generating charts and uh, generating actually a, about half of the website is now in our little test site up in the cloud. And so we're going to continue to build that out. And at some point, hopefully in a couple of months, we'll be able to convert from our existing data center here at Stock Charts headquarters up until up into the cloud. And so uh, stay tuned for more news on that. Um, we are going to be rolling out later this week a new search feature. Um, so search is a, uh, is a little known kind of unheralded feature of the website. Uh, it's something that uh, in the past has worked well. And then over time, it kind of stops working so well. And it starts to to, when you search for things using the stock charts uh, magnifying glass, sometimes you don't get the results you want. Um, we're constantly uh, tweaking the, the existing system, but we've also been in the process of completely uh, upgrading it and replacing it with something better, which by the way, does take advantage of some cloud features. Um, and so that new version of search will be rolling out later this week. It's gonna be a quiet rollout, but for those of you paying attention, you will, you will notice some of those extra features soon. Uh, Greg's book uh, has continued to do very, very well. It's continuing to uh, to sell extremely quickly. If you haven't gotten a copy, you might want to might want to look into that. Go up onto the Stock Charts store and look for uh, Stock Charts for Dummies. Uh, it's uh, despite the name, <laughs> has been selling to both uh, to both smart and uh, and not so smart people, and and doing extremely well. And uh, so we're very very happy with that. I also want to point out um, there'll be more people pointing this out over the course of the next uh, day and pretty much every day uh, going forward. Uh, ChartCon. Uh, ChartCon is extremely exciting and we're putting a lot of energy into it. Don't be fooled. Uh, this is not some afterthought. We are, we are very, very, very um, focused on making ChartCon 2018 a really useful and uh, wonderful experience. I also wanted to mention that the pricing that currently exists is early bird pricing, and that pricing won't be available much longer, about another month, maybe a little less. Um, it will be ending soon, and you want to get in on it sooner rather than later. We need people to sign up for it now. It helps us with our planning. It helps us with uh, making sure that we have the capacity that we need to serve everybody, because, again, the ChartCon this year is a, a virtual conference. In fact, I've got a, um, a little slide. If you haven't seen this, you can go to um, stockchurch.com slash chartcon and uh, you can learn all about it. You can register and see the agenda. Um, our, our key mission here is talking about risk and helping everyone deal with uh, risky markets in a better way using technical analysis. And we have a lot of uh, presenters here. I'm sure you I hope you've seen this before, um, but we have some new people. Uh, uh, Tushar Chande was on uh, this show uh, last week and uh, got a lot of very positive response. Uh, Aaron Swenland, I've heard she's a she's an up and comer 
in the field of technical analysis. Some of our other, though, very popular uh, people will be here. And so um, ChartCon 2018, don't miss it. And uh, don't wait too long to register. Uh, more details on that page, um, stockcharts.com slash chartcon. Uh, and then finally, uh, in terms of what's new with Stock Charts, is we are uh, actually in the process of testing Stock Charts TV. Stock Charts TV will be the next uh, the outgrowth of this show. Uh, so instead of having just a show on during the lunch hour or lunchtime, we're going to be on 24-7. Uh, we're going to have a lot of uh, recorded content as well as more live shows. Uh, we're going to have rebroadcasts of existing shows, lots and lots of different um, segments and and information about technical analysis about the market about what's going on in the market so um, that's really really going to be uh, exciting when that launches and that launch is going to have is just around the corner we're literally doing testing on that right now in addition we have been working on a mobile app so for those of you that want to be able to watch stock charts tv or this show from a mobile device your phone or your tablet uh pre very soon we we sit we literally sent it off to apple yesterday and Google Play. Uh, so it will be in the Apple Store within a week. Uh, I understand they take a little bit of time to approve these things, but within a week, you'll be able to go up to the, uh, the store and get for free a, uh, a mobile app, and that mobile app will let you uh, see what's going on, Stock Charts TV. So very exciting stuff there. That's our first mobile app ever. Anyway, so um, there's other stuff happening at Stock Charts all the time, but those were some of the key things that I wanted to make sure everyone was, was uh, aware of. So let me take a second. I'm, I'm gonna, I pulled some slides from an old presentation that I've done. So some of the charts are a little outdated, but the, the concepts are still good. I wanna make sure that everyone understands what point and figure charts are, how they're useful, and why you should be looking at them. And this is, this is just in a general context. I know Bruce Frazier occasionally has talked about this in the, in the in context of Wyckoff, which is great, but you can also use point and figure charts you know, for anything, really. And so I wanna make sure you understand how they work and what they do. Uh, first off, in, in case you're new, point and figure charts are these charts that have a rising column of X's and a falling column of O's. So as prices move up, um, basically, you don't go to the side, instead you just go higher and add more X's to this column. And, and then as prices reverse and go down, you add O's. And then when they reverse again and go up, you add more X's and so on and so forth. Um, the key point is that at, over time, you get a chart that looks like this, but this is, this is different from a regular bar and candlestick chart because the chart only expands to the right as volatility requires it to. And that's very important to understand. The vertical scale here is not necessarily um, uh, the same distance all the time as, as time goes on. Um, there, can be part, there can be parts of this vertical scale where the, the um, chart will not expand at all because there's no volatility. So the shape of the chart is controlled by volatility. Another very important thing to understand when you're looking at a point and figure chart is that the way the chart's constructed will automatically filter out insignificant price movements. So movements where there isn't a whole lot of volatility and things are just going sideways, kind of noise, noisy kind of movements, those are automatically removed from PNF charts. And it's very important to remember that because what that means is that anything you see on a point and figure chart is automatically significant. It's automatically important because the insignificant stuff has been removed. So when you ever see a reversal, in other words, going from a column of X's to a column of O's, that is a significant change in the trend. Now, the word significant, I'll show you in just a second, that's controlled by the settings on the chart, and you can, you can change those. But in general, um, the, the default settings will do a pretty good job for you, and they will remove, again, these insignificant price movements. As a someone who uh, maybe you're used to looking at a bar or candlestick chart over time, like, like what Tom was just showing a second ago, um, your eye, over time, your eye develops a, a filter where you're automatically um, ignoring movements that might be, you, you consider insignificant or that might be ins insignificant. What you have to remember is when you're looking at a PNF chart, you have to turn off that filter. Every change in a PNF chart is already uh, deemed to be significant. So, how does a PNF chart relate to a bar chart? So I've got a little um, uh, analogy here, a mechanical analogy that hopefully will help with this. I'm not sure how many people have seen kind of a, an old lamp with an accordion kind of a, kind of a thing where you, you can stretch it out like this and then you can stretch it back. So 
this is the analogy that I have. The stretched out version of this is the bar chart, and the stretch back version is the PNF chart. So, so see how that line there that I just um, highlighted is 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 a, a corresponds to a metal bar in the um, in this accordion. And when the when the um, accordion is stretched out, the lines, either this line or this line, those they're um, they're slanted. But then as the accordion is drawn back in and the, the lamp goes back towards the wall, that, that slanted line becomes a vertical line. This is the, this is the effect that happens with PNF charts. So let me show you what I mean. Here's a, here's a regular line chart, a kind of a longer term chart, uh, in this case of Dell. And I've added some, uh, just automatically added some zigzags here to show you kind of where, where certain trends start and end. And think of the PNF chart as the collapsed version of that long chart. So there it is stretched out, and there it is collapsed. And let me show you, if, if we stretch this out one more time, and then we drop in a line just like we did before. So look at that trend line. That trend area right there, that downtrend, corresponds directly to this um, falling column of O's here on the PNF chart. So if you keep that kind of mental picture in, in mind, um, I hopefully PNF charts will make a little more sense to you. The trends, any kind of trend that you see on a regular chart is represented by a vertical column on a PNF chart. So hopefully that makes sense. There we go. Okay, come on. There we go. Right. So let me show you the uh, where you can get PNF charts on the stock chart site. Um, I'm going to come here to. Uh, the stock charts website, and if we go, I don't know, to the members page, uh, you can create a regular bar and candlestick charts with our sharp charts tool. But if you drop this down and you click on PNF charts and type in a ticker symbol uh, and press enter, now you're on the PNF workbench. And there are many other ways to get there, but this is this is one of the easier ways. And here's a PNF chart of IBM. Uh, we can see some trend lines on this chart. We can also see some letters and numbers. The letters and numbers represent um, the the point in time where a new month of the year started. So the numbers go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then A, B, C, which represents uh, October, November, December, and then the 1 represents January, and then here's February, and here's March. And so you can get a sense. As the numbers are really close together, it means that the, the, the stock ha uh, didn't have a lot of volatility and therefore didn't have a lot of changes in its point and figure chart. We can see here the distance between the start of 2017 and the start of 2018 is pretty pretty small. Whereas, for instance, the distance between 2016 and 2017 was larger, and so on and so forth. So that's what I mean by that the um, the horizontal scale, the time scale on a PNF chart, is not uh, symmetrical. It's not it's not equidistant. It can vary, and uh, that that's interesting. The other interesting thing, and I'll talk about this a little more, is these trend lines. Trend lines on a PNF chart can be drawn automatically by the computer, which is really nice. Uh, and they're always at a 45 degree angle. I'll also just as a side note state that PNF charts should always be drawn with blocks that are um, the same size that, that are square square. And if you ever see a PNF chart on some other site um, that has kind of rectangular or squished blocks, uh, run screaming, those those charts are not going to be too helpful to you. PNF charts by definition have to be square. Anyway, um, so at this point, what can we say about IBM? Just really quickly, we see that IBM is in an uptrend. It's in a rising column of Xs. This green X was added today. It's green because it was added today since the market opened. And uh, that's nice. But we can also see that IBM has fallen down a little bit. It's now down at 159.66. That's very close to reversing. If it falls below, um, in this case, it's going to be 158. Uh, then it will reverse into another column of Os. Those, those rules for when it reverses and when new columns are added are part of what's called the chart scaling. And at this point, in this particular chart, I've got a, uh, a traditional three box reversal chart up. You can learn a lot more about all the different settings and all the different reversal methods by looking at the instructions or looking at the chart school article on point figure charts. Lots of other, uh, lots of other settings down here. You could take, if those uh, month uh, letters and numbers bother you, you can take them off for instance, other kinds of things you could do. So I just wanted to quickly show you the workbench, make sure you're aware of it, and I encourage you to, um, to spend a little more time with it uh, when you get a chance. Um, just real quickly to finish up, um, I mentioned the trend lines. The trend lines are drawn at 45 degrees. Um, and then keep in mind, these trend lines are 
trend lines on a chart where each vertical bar is itself a trend line on a bar chart. So that means that a PNF trend line is really a trend of trends. That's kind of different and, and I think pretty significant. So it'd be really nice to know if the trend of trends is increasing or decreasing. Um, and, and the way you draw trend lines, again, the computer will do it for you automatically, but you just basically find a peak or a trough and you start drawing a 45 degree line from it until it runs into the chart again. So there's some more examples of that. One last thing uh, I'll mention to you, uh, chart patterns. Uh, PNF has many chart patterns, and the really nice thing about them is that they're objective, they're not subjective. Um, bar and candlestick chart patterns uh, are a little bit in the eye of the beholder. One person's uh, rising triangle is another person's head and shoulders, so on and so forth. Um, PNF patterns, on the other hand, have very clear rules. Uh, there's no argument about whether they exist or not. And the, also, the computer can find them which is really, really nice. Um, we actually will show them on the chart themselves, and we also have them in our scan engine. And so our scan engine can find them for you. But the, the other thing to keep in mind, again, is that PNF patterns are patterns of trends because the underlying X's and O's represent trends on the bar chart. So that's really interesting as well. Um, here's some examples of PNF patterns. And we can see, like, here's an example of a breakdown where the O's go below the previous column of O's. And at that point, that's a breakdown. There are many, many other kinds. And our chart school has all of these uh, described very clearly for you. And then finally, you can go on the free charts page or, you, or on the members page as well over to the predefined scanned area. You scroll down on the predefined scans page, and you'll find our automatically detected PNF patterns. Uh, for bullish patterns as well as for bearish patterns. What's really interesting is you can kind of get a sense of the market just by looking at these. If, the, if there are lots of bullish patterns and, and lots of green here, then the market's doing well. If there are lots of red and not so much green, then, um, the, um, then that particular pattern is doing less well. So we, we've broken them up into bullish and bearish to help you with that. Uh, with that, uh, that's my introduction, my 15-minute uh, introduction to PNF charts. It, it's a topic that really deserves probably 15 hours, but um, hey, I do what I can. Uh, do we have any good questions that have come in through the chat so far? Uh, somebody was asking about uh, point and figure price objectives. Okay, so price objectives, you can read more about them in chart school is a uh, older technique for determining a potential, and I gotta underline the word potential, um, uh, places that the, that the um, prices might go based on the history of the PNF chart. So there's a specific calculation that can be done on PNF charts where you, you take, uh, I won't get into it, but you, you take basically uh, how long a, um, it's been moving sideways on the PNF chart, and then you can use that to project. We see, for instance, on this one, a price objective of 63 going down. Um, I would say those objectives are um, wishful thinking in many cases. I've never really seen a whole, I've never seen patterns or, or actual stocks meet their objectives that often. Um, and many of the price objectives are wildly above or below the existing price. Um, other people swear by them. So I guess your mileage might vary, and but before you use them at all, you really want to read the Chart School article explaining them. There are, by the way, several different kinds of price objectives. You want to make sure you understand the calculation and decide for yourself if you're going to buy into the logic. I kind of don't, but that's just you. Do you um, use point and figure chip when, in your trading? I do not trade, so I don't. I can't oh. say that I use point and figure in my trading. Uh, as president of the company, I put all my money in a blind trust. Okay. All right. Well, I, I just blindly trade pretty much. I know exactly. <laughs> I was just going to say. <laughs> Mine's a blind uh, trading method as well. Yeah, something about blind leading the blind, right? Well, I believe that point and figure charts are a really good check on reality. So even if you're not necessarily a, a PNF aficionado, let's say that you are very interested in buying a, a chart that you've been looking at using regular bar and candlestick approaches, or maybe Tom's been yakking about it for a while. Well, a PNF chart can be a like a final little test. Um, if if you think everything looks good, but you look at the PNF chart and it's actually in a downtrend like we see here, maybe also in a, a row of a descending column of O's, that might be a, a, a warning sign 
a, a thing to say, oh, well, I'm not really necessarily going to pull the trigger on this until this uh, PNF chart starts to look a little better. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, let's see. Everybody wants the silver bullet. They want the... <laughs> How does it stack up against other indicators, the point figure patterns? I, I mean, personally, I haven't really studied it that closely. Well, again, I don't, a point figure is not an indicator. It's a, uh, it's a charting technique. And it's a charting technique that uh, removes noise. And so if you're having trouble, um, you know, with bar and candlestick charts, kind of seeing the bigger picture of what's going on, uh, I think point and figure charts can help you see that bigger picture. Like the, the, the way that they're constructed by definition will kind of get rid of that noise and let you focus in on the most significant price movements. But again, you, you have to consider every single movement on a PNF chart to be significant. That's not necessarily true on bar and candlestick charts. Um, but the fact that, for instance, in this particular chart, which again is Boeing a long time ago, but um, the fact that this, this chart was in a downtrend um, is something that you, you can't ignore. That's a, a downtrend of the trends. So as each trend has, has, as each uptrend has tried and petered out, those uptrends have been, the, the uptrends have been petering out at lower and lower levels. And so that's, that's a fairly significant thing. Excellent. Right, well, you will not necessarily be able to, to see or, or divine from looking at a standard bar and candlestick chart. Oh, we got a comment. It would be great if we could occasionally see Tom and Aaron use them. <laughs> yeah, oh, we'll see about that. That was for me. I'm sorry. I, I... <laughs> <laughs> yes, I like to, to be uh, a little bit more expert about the tools I show, and I feel far from expert as far as point and figure charts, so I don't know if what I would present would be necessarily all that useful, but... We'll work on that. And as I mentioned, point and figure charts are a big part of Wyckoff. And uh, Bruce Frazier also does a, a really good job of explaining them and showing them off. Uh, but don't be fooled. Again, they can be used for more than just Wyckoff. There you go. I can definitely see the benefits, especially the objective approach. I mean, you know, if it's, you know, you hit a certain target, X goes in the column, you keep going up, you hit another target, X goes in the column. It's not like, well, the volume was light or it, it's strictly looking at the price action and, you know, moving up. I, I see benefits, but for me and my trading style, because I am, you know, I do look at the pennies as far as, you know, where price support, where resistance is. For me, just using rounded numbers or percentages, it just doesn't work in my own trading style. And that's why I don't uh, talk about it much. But I definitely can see, you know, depending on your own trading strategy and style, how PNF could certainly be a great uh, a benefit to many. Indeed. Uh, let's see. I have one more question that just came in. Please ask Chip about Ranko charts versus point and figure charts. I would imagine where should they go to read more about that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Renko charts are, are sim very similar to PNF charts. It's a great question. Uh, maybe in, in coming back, I will I will do a segment on Renko charts in the future. I mean, essentially, the reason I'm talking about PNF charts is the same reason uh, every time I, I think about putting together information for this segment, I'm going to try and put together information that, about stuff that Tom and Aaron aren't familiar with and that they don't talk about that much, um, specifically for that reason. And so uh, Renko charts, uh, Hiken Ashi charts are another one that's on my list. Um, cloud Ichimoku cloud charts, all those things are wonderful things, and I hope to hope to be showing them off and talking about them over the couple, next couple of weeks and months. Excellent, awesome. Well, before you leave, does Carolina at least get to the final four? I need to know who's coming out of the West. I think it. I think it does. Absolutely, a two seed. They were okay. in good shape. One seeds are always, you know, subject to uh, being a uh, an upset, but a two seed. Uh, has a good chance. Yeah. And, well, you got Xavier as the number one seed out West. So, you know, I think a lot of folks, if, when you're looking across at the number one seeds, I think Virginia's had a strong year. Of course, Villanova, a uh, great program and Kansas, uh, certainly a great program. So everyone's kind of, I think, zeroing in on Xavier is maybe the one area where uh, maybe we'll get some upsets. And so Carolina, Carolina could be back in the final four again. It's going to be exciting. It all depends on the X's and the O's, just like the P and F charts. <laughs> exactly. Way to tie it all back yes, together. Nice work. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Chip. Appreciate you coming on. All right. Thanks, everybody. Yay. And there he goes. And so with that, we are going to move into cause and effect. And Aaron, I know uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the dollar and things that you need to think about. And Aaron, why don't you take it away? And I shall do just that. 
So one of the things we were thinking about for uh, this segment is the dollar and how it affects uh, other commodities and prices and the small caps. And so we're going to cover some of that. But I wanted to talk about the dollar and gold and the cause and effect that it occurs there. And I, I think most people are familiar with with all of this, but I, it's always a good refresher anyway. Uh, you know, gold is a commodity and it is priced in the dollar. OK, so the price of the, the strength of the dollar uh, does affect what happens to gold and which is why you sometimes will see uh, that negative correlation. Let's see, I'll get to this one. All right. So you have almost a, a perfect inverse uh, correlation here. So when the dollar goes up, gold tip typically goes down. Um, the main thing to remember is it's not a, a reverse type of a relationship because the, the reason there is this relationship is, again, because gold is priced by the dollar. And so you don't go from, say, oh, gold went down. That means the dollar is going to go up. It, it doesn't, it's not a cause and effect backwards that way. Uh, the, the cause is the price of the dollar and how much you can get uh, of gold with that. Now, it isn't, the price of gold isn't always just dependent on the price of what's going on with the dollar. And one of the a great place to learn more about this and, and understand it more is at kitco.com. It's just a place I go. I'm not, you know, I don't work for them or anything, but they're just very uh, useful. So one of the nice things is up here is it tells you did uh, these commodities, palladium in this uh, example, really go up however much it's saying. And this is a great place to find out more about why, what the uh, relationship is between the dollar and gold. And so I really like using this because you have, yes, you have what happens based on the dollar, but of course you also have buyers and sellers in the marketplace. So the change in gold is affected by both. And I find this site to be especially helpful. So if I see something very strange, like, you know, the dollar, uh, goes up quite by quite a bit, and then gold also goes up uh, a certain amount, then I would come to this page and I would look at what was actually affecting the uh, price of the dollar or the price of gold. Sorry about that. So I think this is a great place. And, and also, if you wanted to read more about this, you can read it right here. It's, uh, you know, basically tells you exactly what I did, uh, a little bit more detailed. So so that's basically the, the idea. So when the dollar gets weaker, it takes more dollars to actually purchase that commodity. And so that's why you'll see that commodity rise. And when, it, when the dollar is stronger, of course, it, you don't have to have as many dollars to buy that commodity. So then the price goes down. And that's the cause and effect. So uh, I figured we'd look a little bit, of, a little bit of, uh, about this. So again, I, I like looking at this correlation. And one thing, and I'm going to get this on an annotate here because I want to annotate a few things. All right. So as far as uh, the correlation goes, uh, I wanted to look at, so we have these areas where the correlation is very strong. And what I find interesting is that as of late, uh, the correlation has been extremely strong. We haven't really seen any of these uh, mountains coming in as far as that correlation is concerned. And so for me, when I look at the dollar chart and I realize how close the correlation is right now between the dollar and gold, that will affect my uh, forecast, I guess you could call it, um, my uh, wind sock. It, it helps me determine the direction. And so I will use this, the fact that I know that the correlation is mostly inverse right now, almost perfectly so, to determine if the dollar is going down like today, we're seeing the dollar is, is uh, weakening today, then I know that I likely am going to be seeing gold moving higher because this correlation is so close right now in the inverse direction. So I think it's important to understand those, you know, what is affecting 
uh, the prices of gold. And, and like I said, I think where a lot of people will get into trouble is, is they think of gold as the cause and its effect on the dollar. And that is not a, a true comparison because it's really the reason they travel differently is because of gold being priced as a dollar. And so with that, I'm going to pass it over to you, Tom, because I think you can expand on this a little bit more. If uh, Did you mute yourself? No, I've got it here. I'm okay. uh, leaving one chart here. Um, actually, I'll just leave it here. I don't need to. Uh, let me see if I think everybody will be able to see this. I was annotating, but I'm not going to save. So here you can see this is the UUP. So I figured before we talk about the direction and the effect that it could have on small caps and commodities in general, first let's just take a look at the UUP, which is the proxy for the dollar. And you can see that the low that was set back in September was at about 23.65. We bounced back up again, came down, and eventually we cleared that low to the downside, put in a double, maybe even triple bottom here, came back up and hit uh, a high about 23.75, so slightly above this 23.65 area. And now we're starting to roll back over. I think this is going to be a real critical area. And a number of our guests that we've had on, we've talked to about the dollar. And I think just about everyone is you know, watching the dollar very closely here because I think it does really matter in terms of your trading strategies and some of the areas of the market that you want to focus on. Uh, a lot of that's based on what happens with the dollar. But as we were putting in these lows here, you can see that the PPO had gone much higher. So I think the downside momentum had slowed. We came all the way back, and this is what I look for when I get these positive divergences. You can see the PPO uh, coming back up and uh, clearly getting to the uh, center line. So after you get a positive divergence, that's what I look for. I look for a move back to test the 50-period moving average and the PPO center line, and we've gotten both of those. So I think right now the dollar is trading in this range, and if we break below these prior low lows, I think that's very bearish for the dollar. I think if we break above 2375, it becomes very bullish for the dollar. And I wanted to start with that because I think that's going to have a really important impact going forward uh, on, number one, the Russell 2000 and whether or not you want to focus more on small caps or whether you want to continue to focus on S&P 500 stocks, the larger cap stocks. So this is a chart that I've brought up multiple times. I think it's a great one to always you know, keep in mind and, and use as a refresher. But I like to compare, when we talk about the dollar, I like to compare what's going on in terms of treasury yields here in the U.S. and foreign treasury yields, particularly Germany. Uh, my, my history and research going back is that a lot of the markets here in the U.S. tend to move um, with positive correlation with the, the German market, both in terms of equities and uh, uh, bonds. So here you can see the relationship between the U.S. Treasury yield and the German Treasury yield over the last 10 years. And for the most part, it's been rising, meaning that uh, yields here in the U.S. are going up faster than Germany. And what normally happens is when the U.S. Uh, yields are moving up faster, when rates are moving up faster here than they are globally, that normally will send the dollar higher. Um, now, what I did is I highlighted a few periods, a couple of periods, one back in 2009 and another one in 2013 into 2014, where we ran into a little bit of negative correlation, which is very unusual. Here you can see that rates were rising in the U.S. relative to Germany. Same thing here, 2013 into 2014. But during these periods, the dollar was falling. And if you look at what's been going on here just recently, we see the same thing. This is the third time where we've seen an extended period where yields are rising and the dollar's falling. The last two times, the dollar has played catch up. We've had huge moves higher in the dollar to catch up with this yield uh, discrepancy. So that's kind of the backdrop of something that I think is really important. If we get this breakout on the dollar index, which again, I used the UUP before, that's a proxy for the dollar index. Dollar index has been declining for the last year. And if you notice down here, this is the correlation we spend most of the time with correlation above zero, meaning that these two, uh, the difference in yields and the dollar are positively correlated. Um, but you can see this is the third time now where we've seen this negative correlation go down to minus uh, 0 0.5, and they all cor uh, correspond with these red shaded areas. And each of the last two times, we've seen the dollar take off 
And so the question is, is that going to happen again here? Well, we need to see certain breakouts before we can get confirmation on that. We can assume it might happen. That's what I'm assuming. I'm assuming it's going to happen, but we need confirmation of that. And I think getting the dollar index back up over, say, 91 to 91 and a half, I think would be a, a really good start to that. Uh, so that would be one thing to keep in mind. I also wanted to point out, if we're talking about cause and effect, if this truly does happen and the dollar does move up like that, these huge moves up in the dollar, that tends to correspond with huge outperformance in small cap stocks. And if you look at what's been going on here over the past two or three weeks, we're starting to see a lot of outperformance by the small caps. And you can see here, this is the chart that shows it, the Russell 2000 off of a triple bottom here. We are starting to show relative strength again in small caps. And if the dollar continues to bounce and we get that breakout, I think this would be a very, very strong move for the uh, Russell 2000 potentially going forward. So that's one thing uh, definitely to keep in mind. The other uh, cause and effect I wanted to just briefly touch on was with commodities. If, you, uh, you know, if you're a student of history, you look back and you say, well, during the last bull market, commodities outperformed the S&P 500 by quite a margin from 2002 to 2008. This is a relative chart. So CRB was wildly outperforming the S&P during periods of this move. But notice when it had these big moves to the upside, it was during periods when the dollar was declining rapidly. And so we had a different bull market back then than the one we have right now, because I think that we've got the dollar moving up, breaking above this triple top at about 88 on the index. And now we've come back down to test that support level. There's also the, this um, uh, price trend line that uh, is com comes into play as well. And I think I had a chart of that. Uh, and I think that was on my last chart. Let me go back here. Yeah, here you can see the dollar. See the trend line coming right up to about 88? And notice the triple top breakout. We're back to the support area at 88. So 88's a really important support area on the dollar index. And we know from looking at the UUP that that coincides with this 2310 move to the downside. So I want to see this level hold. And to the upside, a breakout above the recent high would likely trigger some of the things we just talked about. If the dollar's going to rise, then that's going to probably continue to put pressure on uh, the uh, commodities area. So I wanted to go into this technical news. Let me bring that chart up one more time real quick, and then we're going to get into the 10 and 10. Um, but here, if you know, during this period where the dollar has been in an uptrend, you know, ignoring the last year, I mean, for the most part, we have been trending higher. And look at the CRB relative to the S&P 500. It's down. So the dollar has some serious implications. If you're wondering why your commodity stocks aren't moving to the upside, well, first of all, I don't quite understand why they didn't outperform in the last year, because the dollar has been down decidedly. And we still cannot seem to get anything going for the commodities. But if the dollar is truly bottoming and we're starting to make a move to the upside, I think commodities are the wrong area to uh, consider. At least I have to start to see some relative strength. We've seen very little relative strength in the commodity space over the past five or six years. And so for me, thinking bullishly about the dollar because of what's going on with the treasury yields right now in the U.S. relative to other areas of the, you know, other parts of the world, I find it real difficult to be in the commodity space. And so hopefully from this exercise, you can kind of see how the dollar has various implications um, in a number of different areas. Aaron showed you gold. Uh, I showed you how it can impact the relationship between the S&P 500 and small caps, and then also how it impacts the relative performance of commodities. So with that, uh, we'll go into the 10 and 10. And Aaron, I believe, uh, do you have the RRG? Make sure you've got your sound yep. on. I'm here. I've got the RRG ready. Okay. Um, I actually did a, decided to do a weekly this time just because all of uh, the points are a little bit more separated and I'm, I'm getting a little bit better understanding of what's going on here. But here's our list and these are the improving groups. Uh, very interesting to see. Of course, these are running strong right now. And I know we're going to look at a few of those in that area. Uh, pretty even amount of picks today as far as the RRG goes. So why don't we just go ahead and get started with the first one again, uh, Gardner Denver Holdings, GDI. All right, uh, GDI, 
actually just finishing up a quick annotation of it. Uh, I think we're in a bullish wedge off an uptrend. It looks to me like we broke, although I'd like to see more volume. But GDI clearly has an uptrend in play. By the way, there's a black candle, and that is typically a short-term reversing candle off of an uptrend uh, because what's happening is you're gapping up. Think of it a little bit like an exhaustive gap, but more of a short-term exhaustive gap where you gap up. Sometimes, I mean, you see here we came down quite a bit, but sometimes it's only a day or two before we start moving higher again. Uh, but in this case, we did top with that uh, black candle. Hey, Tom, we're looking at my screen, not yours. <laughs> I just realized that. <laughs> I could have sworn, but maybe I didn't. Everybody else does. Okay. Well, I'm glad everybody's watching and pay attention. At least we know <laughs> no one's sleeping, or at exactly. least the majority aren't sleeping. Okay. You got my screen? Yep. Okay. Uh, so GDI, here was that black candle I was referring to. Um, and again, off of an uptrend, I look for a reversal. We did get that as we pulled back. But what I'm seeing here, looking at the tops coming down here, is a declining tops trend line. And then here, you've got lower lows. But when you connect these two, you can kind of see how you're squeezing. And off of an uptrend like this, this uh, kind of a, a wedge back to the downside, like this little piece of pie, is actually a bullish wedge. And what you're looking for is a breakout. Now, I would feel much better about this breakout right here if we saw volume picking up. Uh, here, it's a little bit more of a mixed signal. So maybe a couple of areas of resistance to look at. Let me add that to this chart very quickly. Um, but the two areas of price resistance, one comes in right here. That's the end of February high. We're trying to get through that. And then ultimately, the initial reaction high that we saw off of all this selling came in at about uh, the 34 and a half level. And what we could be seeing here, by the way, is a l inverse left shoulder, neckline, lower low to put in the head. We could be working our way back up to 34 and a half, put in the right side of a neckline. This could be another uh, type of bullish pattern that could be emerging here with GDI. So I'm still holding out hope uh, because I am overall bullish the market. I think we're going to probably evolve into some kind of a bullish pattern here with GDI uh, eventually returning back to that high at 38. All righty. Very nice. Uh, the most popular request in the chat room, Square. SQ. Okay. Yeah, I like Square. I wish I had held on when I was trading it. Uh, you know, I just... Uh, I did pretty well with the stock, but obviously I've done a lot better holding. And of course, you never know which ones are going to be the ones to hold and which ones you need to trade and get the heck out of. But uh, Square did make the breakout here. You can see the volume as it cleared that earlier high. I think that's really important. I also think what's important is that with the PPO rising, the way it has been rising, pullbacks to the rising 20-day moving average should hold. And you can see the last couple have done just that as we move up. So I, I'm looking for any weakness to be an opportunity. And I would say that rising 20 day moving average is the area that I would be interested in entering. All right, let's see here. How about uh, the ever popular Amazon? Well, it's just a uh, animal. Uh, <laughs> it just doesn't want to stop. It's part of a, what's helping to carry consumer discretionary and the uh, broadline retailers uh, much higher. I mean, it, there's really nothing that I can say really that's a, a bad here. Uh, you could probably say, well, look, you still got higher prices and the PPO is lower, so you got a negative divergence. I would say this, um, that is a price indication of slowing momentum. It has nothing to do with volume. So I think you have to stay down, You know, look down here at what's going on with volume. When we look back, not only is the price of Amazon going higher, so you would think that maybe the volume would be going lower, but the volume actually is going higher as price goes higher. So that's telling me the dollar volume is soaring on Amazon as it moves higher. That is not a sign of slowing momentum. So I, you know, I would uh, argue against looking solely at the PPO or the MACD or even the PMO or any of these momentum oscillators because they don't take volume into account. And I think there's a lot of accumulation going on. Um, the history here on Amazon is that this rising 20 period moving average has been, uh, whoops, what did I do here? Uh, the rising 20 day has been the area where we wanna really consider the stock. I mean, I could draw all these lines, but I think you can see them. We had one situation here when everything got crazy in the market where we did have two uh, days where we closed below the 20 day. But other than that, the 20 day moving average has been holding. So I think that that is the, uh, 
the key to takeaway here from Amazon is that it continues to outperform the overall market. It's in a great area and 20 day tests have proven to be very successful entry points. Okay. Let's see the next one. Uh, I don't think you've talked about biotech, uh, IBB. Yeah, I still am a big fan of the biotechs. I think we're going to go up and clear, eventually clear that late January high. I think the long-term chart here looks good. I'm going to go back maybe a year because I want to get a little bit more perspective on this uptrend on the IBB. But you can see clearly we've been moving higher. Could even do a, a weekly. Let's let's uh, expand out here to a weekly, five-year. And so longer term, we have this uptrend, and I think that the IBB is eventually going to hit, get back up here to this 136, or 130, maybe 133 area. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just put in the parabola here. This is an extended cup, uh, as you can see, but I think eventually we're going to go back up into this area and uh, have this come back full circle from, well, half circle, really. Uh, but from that high in mid 2015. But I, I think we continue to consolidate here sideways. We did recently put in a higher high, continuing to hold this uh, 50 week moving average. So that might be something to watch to the downside. But I think eventually we're going to make this push all the way back up to that 133 area. All right. Let's see here. How about Johnson and Johnson, J and J? All right. J and J. Um, yeah, this was actually, I think, the top performer in the Dow uh, when I was looking earlier today, and it is making a fairly significant breakout uh, where it had been, you know, kind of held back until uh, Friday of last week. We had not been able to get back up through about 132 and a half. We finally did that at the end of last week, and we're continuing the move to the upside. We've got some gap resistance and the 50-day moving average both coming in at 136. So I think we're going to make a run for that. A breakout above, one, above 136 would be very bullish. All righty. Let's see. Next one, uh, AMD. And I know a lot of people are wondering if that space is, uh, is still good. I love the semis. I mean, they need a pullback um, and they're getting one or they were getting one earlier today. I like today's candle on AMD. The problem I have with AMD, and I'm going to use this relative chart here, um, it's in a great space. Look at the semis going up. But look at AMD relative to the semis. So you look at leadership in the semis, you think NVIDIA, you think Micron, you think applied materials, Intel. AMD has really been struggling again. And this is its long-term history. And I know we were in a period there for a while where AMD was really performing well on a relative basis. But that is not its long-term history. And it may simply be moving back to uh, doing what it does best, which is underperform its index. And this is what I would be looking at when I've got a, a downtrend there relative to an uptrend here. So we, we're in a good group, but on a relative basis, we're down. It just tells me this isn't the stock that I want to really be in at this point. So until it starts to show a little bit more strength and breaks out of the sideways consolidation, I would avoid it. All right. Let's see. Next one for our Canadian friends, Equitable Group. EQB, as in boy, dot T-O. All right. Actually, let me go ahead and just do it on the regular daily chart here. Uh, well, first of all, light volume. So this is going to be something that I tend to shy away from because I just don't like illiquid stocks or stocks that aren't as liquid as I'd like for them to be. Um, but technically, I've got a couple issues here, too. So the first thing I would note is that we're coming up and failing at the 20-day moving average which I don't like. Uh, also, if we use this support resistance line here, you can see that 62 has been pretty good support after this huge gap up and very heavy volume. We held 62. We continued to trade above 62. Here you can see a doji off a downtrend at 62. And then finally, we broke below 62. And look at the volume picking up on that selling. So even if we get through 60, I think we're going to run into some issues in that 60 to 62 zone. I think this one's got work to do. I would avoid it. All right. Uh, the next one, I what a great name. Make My Trip Limited, M-M-Y-T. All right, M-M-Y-T, I like the breakout here, and the volume overall has been pretty strong on a relative basis when you look at this versus where it had been 
trading in terms of volume levels. So we're getting a price breakout confirmed with heavier volume. I think that's a good sign. Um, it is a smaller company, so you got to be prepared for a little bit of volatility. But overall, I think the best entry on a pullback would be at price support and the 20 day moving average, which both come in at 33 right now. All right. This one's kind of interesting. Uh, North Star Realty Europe, uh, NRE, gigantic gap up right now. There are a lot of happy people after they rode that uh, long roller coaster down. Yeah, I think the character of this chart has changed. And so I'll show you a couple of things what I look at. Um, first of all would be the positive divergence that emerged at the very bottom. So here, first of all, notice as we're going down how we keep failing at the 20 day moving average as we fall and the PPO continues to move lower with each price drop. That 20 day moving average, I think, is very significant when you have a PPO that continues to decline like this. But at the very bottom, notice what happened to the PPO. Here you can see we are actually moving back up while the price is dropping. That is a, an indication of slowing momentum. Also, some of these down days where it looked like here, for instance, we were breaking down and the volume was just kind of so-so relative to some of these other bigger candles. So I think we're getting a couple of signs of maybe slowing momentum to the downside. And then notice here, the 20 day moving average did not provide any resistance like it had during this downtrend. So once momentum turns, I think we have a better shot at the 50. Now, in this case, we're getting very heavy volume and a gap above the 50. I think this completely changes the character of the chart. Um, you know, it's difficult for me to chase a stock that's up 15% today and is up so much off of its recent low. But I do think now the 20 day is going to continue to rise quickly. And down the road, I'd have this in a chart list. And down the road, if you get a test maybe of that rising 20 day or possibly even where we gapped and opened uh, today, I think that could be an entry. So I think this one's worth watching, but um, I would not chase it at this point up fit, well, almost 16% today. All right. The final 10 and 10, and I think it is 10 today. Yesterday, I stopped us at nine mistakenly. IBM. And the question was where uh, you'd set a stop on this one. And I give you my opinion, uh, just looking at this. Of course, it depends on your trading horizon, but I'd be looking uh, probably around that 155 range there. Yeah, I think, well, for me, again, I think it's coming back up. You can see that the PPO is crossed over the center line. So that is a bullish development because mm -hmm. now we know that our short term moving average is back above our longer term moving average. And when I see that, um, what I like to see on a stock is the rising 20 day moving average hold. So I think it would bother me if we were to go back and close below that 20 day, which currently is sitting at one, well, almost 157. Mm -hmm. And especially if the volume picks up. Now, if you're more of a, a price person, then I would say maybe the last this last reaction low down here, closer to 152 and change of almost 153. But I don't want to give it that much room. I'd be giving it about $7 to the downside and only looking for eight top side to get up to resistance. So I, I like it more with a tighter stop in and maybe use that rising 20 day moving average. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's trading horizon. That really does, I think, affect, um, I know it affects where I, I put my stops. Uh, because if I'm holding something a very long time, uh, you're going to have to experience those drawdowns now and then. Yeah, and you so, can even look here at this uh, move on IBM, this last move that was, you know, you can see the PPO is rising. And when it pulled back, it came right down to the 20 before we got a bounce. And then mm -hmm. the volume started to pick up on the selling that we saw in early February. Of course, the overall market, um, it was just being taken, yeah. the market in general. Oh, yeah. Now there's, I think there was ample warning, honestly, um, once it hit, you know, came down off of that February, uh, you know, as it was coming down, obviously with the rest of the market, I think that, uh, you know, we had warning. I know with the PMO, there was some warning and then yes, that drop below the 20 was certainly a warning. And at that point, you know, would have saved you part of the way down anyway. Mm -hmm. All right, well, that's all 10 and 10, so. Not bad, not bad. I'll have these symbols up uh, for you to look at after the show, and you'll find them in the Market Watchers live chart list. Just go to our blog, and you will find the link at the top of the blog. So you can find all of the charts that were interesting to us, as well as those that are annotated for the 10 and 10. 
And with that, I think it's time to start talking again. And I won't spend too much time because we did get a lot of uh, ChartCon information from Chip. So I'll just, I'll be very brief. But <clears throat> as he said, we do have uh, early bird pricing running right now. It's a virtual conference, easy to go to. It's, you get the you get all of the video and all of the information to keep after the the uh, educational event, after our online presentation. So recommend you do that. But uh, Chip didn't talk too much about it. But if you would like to join us on uh, ChartCon Live as a VIP, see us in Seattle and then join us on a cruise, the packages are listed and you can uh, take a look at that. So. This price includes not only the cruise, but it also includes uh, the VIP package over here as well. And, and I would also uh, just add on that, uh, Aaron, that this is uh, focused on risk and risk management. And keep in mind, we're nine years into a bull market here. We just had one of the biggest scares we've had in the last couple of years. So I think that the timing, you know, this summer of uh, taking a look and trying to manage risk, I think couldn't be better. So that's yeah. a, another a key thing to, to consider. Um, I, I would recommend this to anyone who is managing their own trading or portfolio. Um, and, and to be honest, uh, I think it's probably good if you got your, your children involved or maybe siblings or, or even grandchildren. Um, I think it would be really important to uh, get them started on the right foot, point them in the right direction. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm going to now move on to the market update. All right, here we go. Get to our candle glance, uh, look at our, our two day charts here. Very short term view. Uh, really interesting trading today, you know, with the, the major indexes. We started up on the morning, looked pretty good, and then spent the rest of the day trailing off back into negative territory. But look, we're now starting to see a rebound here, a nice little bounce. And you know, the Dow and the Russell 2000 are in positive territory. We'll have to see if the S&P can get there. Interestingly, you know, the NASDAQ and tech has been doing so well. And, you know, we're seeing the, the NASDAQ today a little bit um, compressed. It's not doing quite as well as the others. So interesting that we're getting that kind of volatility. Uh, we can see that uh, treasury yields are down somewhat, reading at 2852. UUP is continuing lower, as you can see. And what's happening with gold, as we were just talking about cause and effect, gold is on its way up, like that flag uh, on the intraday chart here uh, and that breakout. So we could see uh, gold rising further. And again, that's probably because I'm bearish on gold and bullish on the dollar. <laughs> The VIX is reading right now about 1581 and uh, the advanced decline index we can see is almost even here from yesterday. Let's go over to the market summary. And let's look at what's going on with those sectors. If we're seeing the strength that we were seeing earlier today. And it does appear that healthcare and industrials are leading right now as far as our sector spiders. I know we were, I think uh, we talked a bit about the transports. They're having a specially good day right now. The uh, transportation index over 1% higher, up by over 1%. Sector ETFs, again, technology is the laggard. Not a, again, not a surprise seeing the NASDAQ getting hurt as far as, well, just lagging behind the other indexes. Airlines and retailers are leading with airlines up over one and a half percent. And we can see oil services and utilities, as well as those semis uh, up here are having the, uh, the problems right now on the negative side. International ETF Singapore is leading. And we can see that most of the, uh, we're seeing about a third of the international ETFs on the positive side uh, lagging our Germany and Russia ETFs. And I'm going to take you back very quickly to our homepage. I wanted to go over a few of the decision point uh, charts here. We have recently, let's see here. Now, I updated the Dow yesterday, so I'm surprised that's not showing. The OEX, we got a short-term trend model buy signal on uh, Friday, and we also got the short-term PMO 
upside crossover. We actually did get an upside cr crossover for the Dow. I don't know why that didn't update, but that happened yesterday. And we have uh, the PMO is still negative on the Dow, but we were within a, like a hundredth of a point of getting that new uh, short-term PMO buy signal. So I would expect to see that at the end of the day, and I'll be writing about that. And we can see also this should be a uh, green arrow. And at this point, it just didn't update. I'll have to double check that after the show. Uh, NASDAQ is still all, uh, NASDAQ 100 still all green and S&P 500. We're looking at that uh, midterm, the weekly PMO is on a sell signal. And that's it for the market update. And I think we'll pass it back to you. Uh, Tom, you want to introduce our what would you do segment? Hello, there he is. <laughs> uh, we're not hearing you though. Hmm. Tom, we can't hear you. I can't hear you anyway. I find the button. I couldn't find <laughs> there it. There we go. I know that's the button happening. disappeared. Uh, but anyway, uh, I got it here. I just wanted to mention one thing before we get into the what would you do, and that is that uh, home construction, which I talked about recently, um, has a positive divergence, starting to show some strength. This is a one-week uh, summary of industry strength, and you can see all of a sudden home construction moving back toward the top of the consumer discretionary space. And if we move this back to intraday, you can see that today it actually is leading in the consumer discretionary space, and we pull up the chart. Uh, this is a pretty nice move that continues getting through that 20 day moving average and up near a major uh, short term resistance area at about the 870, 875 zone. So this is going to be something to watch. Last thing maybe to keep in mind, too, is on the weekly chart, the 20 week moving average is at 866.55 and we're at 866.29. Since this weakness really began, we have not been able to close back above that 20 week moving average. So I just think it's interesting that we're starting to see this shift back into the home construction space. And it's been a quiet, you know, if we went over momentum sleepers right now, I think this would be the group that I would really focus on because this group had a lot of momentum. And when you go through periods where you're, you're building say um, a continuation pattern uh, some, some of these groups can get lost in the shuffle. And I think that's what's going on with home construction right now. I think that the economy continues to strengthen Yes, rates are moving higher, but they're still pretty darn close to historically low levels. And I think that uh, home construction can still uh, perform very well given the current environment. So this is gonna be a development technically that I think is worth watching. And so with that, I don't know, do you wanna start the, uh, what would you do or do you want me to? I'm gonna let you, and that way I can have the final word. All right, well, let's <laughs> so the, the question is, what would you do with the XRT? We were just talking about the, um, whoops, XRT, not S. We were just talking about consumer discretionary. And of course, the XRT retail is one of the areas when you look back to November through January that was really leading the uh, consumer discretionary space. So what would you do? Would you, would you buy the XRT? Would you sell it? Would you just ignore it? You can see recently it's just been going through this sideways phase. And I'll be honest, I'm kind of in the middle of the road right now in retail. This is a time of the year. And let me go ahead and pull that up, the seasonality, because this is the time of the year when we do tend to see retail stocks perform very well. And here you can see February, March, April. This is the, the seasonal, and we're right in the middle of March. So we're right in the middle of this three-month seasonal strength in retail stocks. Another way to look at it is to compare the uh, XRP. Um, sorry. Yes. Apparently, they're not seeing your screen right now. I always forget to grab it, too, after the market update. It must have. I don't know why. It, that's twice. I could have sworn I've switched over. But do you see it now? Uh, yeah. Let's see. Yes, indeed. There you go. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, I apologize. I have no idea. First time I wasn't sure. I thought, well, maybe I didn't grab it. But this time I was sure I grabbed it. So I'm not sure what happened. But anyway, uh, the XRT, this is the seasonal chart. And I'll go back to the regular chart in a minute and go over what I just spoke about. But this is the XRT um, first, just how it's performed February through April over the last 13 years. It's averaged going up two and a half percent in February, four percent in March and two point eight percent in April. And this is definitely, I think, when you look at these little mountain peaks, uh, this is the time of the year when we do tend to see outperformance in the XRT. 
And so I was going to click on this relative to the S&P 500 and just show you the outperformance in February and March and even some additional outperformance in April relative to the S&P 500. So we're in this sweet spot for the XRT, and I think we're turning more bullish. So I think we're going to get this breakout on the XRT. But the question for me is if we want to buy the XRT, is it going to outperform the S&P 500? Because I want to I want to be invested in something that's going to outperform the S&P 500. So when we pull this up and look at the relative strength, first we'll look at the daily chart. And let's go with a line chart. Uh, you can see that we kind of put this double top in here and we have broken down below a, uh, you know, kind of a relative support area just at about the 0 0.01645 level and starting to turn back up. So it's, it's this is going to be a really important time, I think, for retail to see whether or not it can regain its relative strength. Now, I like the XLY versus the S&P 500. I'm going to come back to the XRT but kind of bringing a lot of different things into this argument. But I think the XLY was the clear leader in terms of sector strength, relative sector strength from November through early February. And now we've just been going through what I think is just consolidation before another move to the upside. So I believe the XLY is going to outperform, but I don't know that the XRT is going to lead it like it had previously. I've got to see more. Uh, you can see that on this chart, the XLY is hanging pretty close to its recent high. But if we look at the XRT relative to the S&P 500, again, you'll see that we are really starting to decline quite a bit. And if I pull up the XRT relative to the XLY, you can see that the re relationship has really deteriorated since the beginning of the year. So I like consumer discretionary. I think that the XRT has to show me a little bit more. So as of today, right now, I'm going to say I would be a seller of the XRT because I think we can find other areas of the market that are going to perform better. And then the final thing, final comment is from a seasonal perspective, I think that the XRT is starting to run out of its seasonal, that seasonal period when it's bullish. So I'm going to say sell. All right. Yeah, and I know people are complaining because the poll is bullish or bearish. There's no, there's no in between. You I'll must vote one way or the other. I'll be bearish. You'll be bearish. Okay. Um, I looked at this chart, and there are a lot of mixed messages here. The first thing I noted was uh, you could actually see a short-term symmetrical triangle, but I opted to draw it out a bit further because we do have a, a pretty solid declining tops trend line here. So and as, as well as a rising bottoms that, that go back uh, into late January. So I decided to set that up. Okay, symmetrical triangles, those are typically continuation patterns. So the expectation coming off of a, a rise like we're seeing here, and in fact, I think if I just went quickly over to the weekly chart, you might see it better. Yeah. So, well, actually now, when I look at this on the weekly chart, I see uh, it was in a downtrend. But I'm going to go with the fact we've been in a major uptrend. We did have that drop, and I think that was you know, obviously due to the problems that the market showed during that period of time. But there's currently a lot of indecision, and I think that was represented well in the uh, relative charts you were looking at. So here are the things I see. So I'm... I'm uh, not happy about these EMAs. I'm going to direct you here to the thumbnail. I'm not happy about the fact that they are starting at what I call braid. And, you know, our trend models are based on the EMA crossovers. So when I start seeing these start braiding and, you know, crossing over each other back and forth, whipsaw, uh, I, I would stay away from it. And it does not tell us really which direction to expect. I think you're best news here when I look in the thumbnail is it does appear that that 20 day EMA may be turning up here and starting to diverge a little bit from the 50 day EMA, but overall uh, not, not really pretty for the intermediate or short term. There is hope, however, um, and which is what I'm going to hang my hat on here. Since you went bearish, I'll go ahead and go uh, to the bullish side here because I would expect an upside breakout. And 
the only issue is this is going to be really strong overhead resistance right at that 46, uh, 4625 area. It will need a lot to get through there. And if it gets through there, I think, uh, you know, as I think my mom always said, Katie, bar the door. Uh, I do think it would be able to start making its way up and start testing these highs back in January. But I would definitely want to wait to see if that area of overhead resistance is penetrated. But since we don't have a selection that says wait and see, <laughs> I'm going to go with the fact we do have a uh, confirmation with the on balance volume uh, lows, uh, bottoms, they're rising along with the price bottoms. Not thrilled with this PMO that has been sort of trending lower. But I'm going to give it the benefit of the doubt and and say it's more of a, um, you know, the sideways action is due to no acceleration here. So if there's no price acceleration, you're going to flatten out. And so I'm going to give it the benefit of the doubt that we're getting a bottom coming in here. And so honestly, if I were considering this as a buy, I, I would. Like I said, we can't do wait and see, but I think in particular, I would look for that PMO to actually get the positive crossover, at least really show some interest in moving up above the PMO. But that area of overhead resistance, I think is just key. So I'm gonna go with, um, I'm gonna be bullish on this just because between the pattern and the PMO wants to turn up, OBB looks decent, so. I'm going in with the um, buy hold. So here is what we said. Uh, Tom's going bearish. I'm going bullish. And what it, what's going on with the audience? Let's check check out that poll and see what. I, I would also say, too, I, I think there's a lot of caveats here. I think the market's going higher. So I think the XRT is going to go higher. I just don't know if it's going to outperform the S&P. So when I say sell short, I don't mean that this, I think that the XRT. Right go lower i just i'm not cons i'm not sure it's going to outperform the s p okay yeah like i said you're right there are a lot of caveats but if we're going to just go you know black and white here um i i'm going to go with the buy hold and i'm putting you down in the bearish column let's That's put fine. it that way <laughs> i mean there, so we'll are see. there are also pockets of retailers that, for instance the broadline retailers look awesome i mm -hmm. think the specialty retailers look really good um, but then you get into the other areas, like you got the home improvement retailers, which have been very weak. And so there are different pockets. It's really, but the XRT is a very broad measure of retail. It, it includes a lot of different areas of retail. And so you got some really positive, you got some not so positive. And then, you know, are you trying to outperform the S and P or are you just looking to see whether it goes up or down? A lot of things to consider, but uh, I'm okay being on the sell short side. Yeah. All right. Well, it's uh, actually that time, Tom. We got to start wrapping this thing up. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're into another week. Um, you know, I'm kind of interested to see how the the market, um, you know, finishes today, uh, because when you look at the Nasdaq, as I pointed out earlier on the 60 minute charts, we do have negative divergences, but we have at this point printed a, a an hourly candle that is a doji, meaning that intra intra hour. We went below the 20 hour moving average, but we came back up, we closed above it. And so we're trying to hang on and we might just see some sideways consolidation after this big run up as well. That could be another mm -hmm. possibility. But uh, you, are you looking for anything in particular as we wrap up the day and head into the balance of the week? Uh, you know, I, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm really curious about this dollar versus gold thing going on right now, because I feel like I've been sitting here forever waiting for the dollar to break out and, you know, see gold, you know, lose uh, more, start showing even more weakness. So I'm kind of watching that dollar to see what's going to happen, because as we said, with cause and effect, it's going to affect, uh, you know, commodity prices and, and that sort of thing. So I'll be paying attention to that, but I'd like to say in, in closing, though, I am still taking requests for what you'd like me to do in my workshop on Friday. And uh, let's see, leading uh, the list of things that I've gotten from all of you are volume indicators, how to use volume in your trading, which I'm kind of leaning to right now. Uh, moving averages, uh, possibly portfolio management, or at least in terms of long-term investing. 
and stops. So we'll see. Uh, the weekly schedule, though, we've got Greg Morris is going to be with us here tomorrow. I love talking to him. And Julius de Kempenar is going to be with us on Thursday. And then, as I said, Friday, I'm going to be doing my workshop. And I would love your thoughts and ideas uh, in uh, the survey. And somebody did mention candlestick patterns for my workshop. I'm not the person to talk to about candlesticks. I don't use them very, very often. So I'm going to have to pass on that one. But I'll pass that over to you, Tom. I know you do candlesticks. <laughs> I think I did uh, one of our workshops already on some candlestick uh, oh, yeah. or maybe some single candlestick patterns. I'm not quite sure. I'd have to go back and look, but I'm always talking candlestick, so I have, can't keep it all straight sometimes when I get into these workshops. Um, but it was great today uh, having Chip on and here, you know, getting an update on the uh, what's going on at stock charts. And uh, if you're late and you didn't hear that presentation, Chip did uh, go into some of the point and figure. Uh, some of the things that you could be looking for on point and figure, uh, maybe just clarifying some questions that many have about point and figure charts. Uh, so that was a great uh, uh, part of the show. And you can go back and listen to the recording if uh, that interests you and you missed it earlier. Um, but as Aaron said, we got a great lineup the rest of the week. I can't uh, wait to talk to both Greg and Julius later in the week. And of course, Aaron, we've got her uh, workshop coming up on Friday. So in the survey below your um, chat, box. Uh, you can click on that link under how do we do and take that brief survey. It's just one question. Uh, but let us know if there's a particular topic that you're interested in for a workshop. And uh, Aaron will definitely sort through those. And maybe we'll do another poll like we did last week and let uh, let you all decide. Well, I don't, I don't know how we'll handle it, but oh, def yeah. yeah, definitely get your thoughts in there. And um, uh, we'll definitely uh, take a look at it and uh, consider it. I uh, want to thank everybody. For joining us today, please remember to complete that survey as you exit. We love to get your feedback and hear what you think of Market Watchers Live. Market Watchers Live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great Tuesday afternoon, everybody. We'll be back here on Wednesday. See you then. Happy trading.